Hello 3D printing friends! Today on the BV3D channel we'll learn how to set up a Raspberry Pi with Octoprint using the pre-configured Octopi SD card image. Stick around and we'll get into it right after this. I'm Brian and you are watching BV3D. Hi, welcome back! Hey, if you're new here and you're wanting to learn about 3D printing, 3D modeling, and other 3D printing related stuff, start now by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. Okay, so today we're going to learn how to set up Octopi. That's the Octoprint 3D printer management system running on a Raspberry Pi single board computer. I was going to do a 2020 edition of the guide, but then 2020 happened, so that didn't happen. Instead, you get my 2021 edition. A few things have changed since my last guide, both in Octoprint and the software I use when going through the setup process, so I wanted to make sure that this was up to date. This video supersedes my previous Octoprint setup videos, so until I make one in 2022, use this one. So a few introductions may be in order. First, I'd like to introduce you to the Raspberry Pi single board computer. Now, these little machines have been around for a number of years now, and I've been playing with them since about 2014 or 2015. They typically run a version of Debian Linux, and they're pretty inexpensive for what you get. Now, the one that I'll be using is the Raspberry Pi 4 Model B, and it's got an Ethernet port and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on board, along with four USB ports, a couple of HDMI video ports, and USB-C input for power. It's also got a bunch of GPIO, or General Purpose Input-Output pins on board, and you could use these for controlling other electronics, reading sensors, and stuff like that. Kind of the same way you'd use an Arduino, although with the Pi, you can connect a keyboard and a screen and actually do all the programming and debugging right on the device. With the Arduino, you write your code on a separate computer, compile it, and upload it. And there are built-in ports for the Raspberry Pi camera and a touchscreen as well. Camera and touchscreen sold separately. Actually, a lot of things are sold separately because the Raspberry Pi is available as just the board, and that keeps the costs down to the bare minimum. But for what we're going to do with it, well, at a minimum, you're going to need a power supply and a micro SD card. Now, for convenience, there are a number of companies selling Raspberry Pi bundles, which include these things. Now, I also want to introduce you to Octoprint, which, of course, is the star of this episode. Now, this is also something that I've been using for years, and I find it to be really useful. Octoprint is the work of the amazing Gina Hoiska. It provides a web interface for your 3D printer. It's fully open source, provides remote control and monitoring of your printer from a web browser, and has a plug-in interface so people can add to its functionality. On your computer, you'll slice models and save the G-code files as you normally would, and then drag and drop the G-code onto Octoprint in your web browser and start printing. And if you're a Prusa Slicer user, you can add the network address of your Octoprint instance to a printer profile and send a print job to the printer right from within Prusa Slicer across your network without having to save the file and drag it somewhere. Like, literally, slice, then print. It's super convenient. Now, the final introduction today is Octopi. Managed by Guy Sheffer, Octopi is an SD card image that you flash onto the micro SD card that you're going to be using as your Raspberry Pi's storage. It's got everything that Octoprint needs in order to run, all in one place and already configured. Now, the recommended Raspberry Pi hardware is a Pi 3B, 3B+, or 4B. You can use the Raspberry Pi on an Ethernet network or a Wi-Fi network. If you're using it on a Wi-Fi network, there's a single text file to edit so that the Pi knows the Wi-Fi network name and password. So now that the introductions are out of the way, here's what we're going to need so that we can get Octopi installed on the micro SD card and get it connected to a Wi-Fi network and start using it to control a 3D printer. First off, we'll need a Raspberry Pi 3B, 3B+, or 4B. I'm using a 4B. We'll also need a computer connected to the same network that the Raspberry Pi will be on, I'm using my Mac, but you can use a Windows PC. We'll need a 32 gig micro SD card, uh, and if necessary, a micro SD card reader for your computer. You'll need a 5 volt 3 amp power supply with a USB Type-C connector, which is the one recommended for a 4B. You'll need a USB cable appropriate for the printer that you're going to control, and the Octopi pre-configured SD card image. 
As of this video, Octopi 0.18 is on the verge of being released, so I'm using Release Candidate 2. We'll also need software to flash the Octopi image onto the microSD card. I'm using Bellina Etcher, which is available for Mac and Windows. Also good to have is a case to install the Pi in. Most Pi bundles include a case, but I printed one that will snap onto the side of the printer. And links for all of this stuff can be found down in the description. So now that we've got all of the things that we need, let's get Octopi onto the SD card. I've downloaded and installed Bellina Etcher and I've downloaded the Octopi SD card image. I've also inserted the micro SD card into a card reader attached to my computer. Now, just a quick warning before we proceed. Like most software, Bellina Etcher does what you tell it to, even if that's not what you meant. So, pay particularly close attention when selecting the target drive, because Etcher is going to obliterate whatever's on it and replace it with the Octopi image. If you're not 100% sure what you're doing, it's probably a good idea to have a recent backup of your computer, just in case. Actually, it's always a good idea to have a recent backup, but especially when doing things that can destroy data. So, here in Bellina Etcher, I'll click Flash from File, and then I'll select the Octopi image file and click Open. Then I'll click Select Target, and I'll check the box to select the card. It shows up here as Generic Mass Storage Class Media with a size of 32 gigs. Now, Etcher hides other larger volumes from view to try to prevent you from selecting your computer's hard drives. Be careful here and remember my warning. Okay, with the card selected, I'll click the Select button. Then I'll click Flash, and Etcher, at least on the Mac, will ask for my password to proceed. Now, it's doing this because we need admin-level access to overwrite disks. Also of note, you need to be doing this from an administrator account on the Mac. If your account is a standard account, you won't be able to complete this step. Sadly, Etcher does not employ the usual Mac OS method of asking for admin access, which means it doesn't ask for an admin username to go along with the password. It simply assumes you're an admin. So, having been supplied with the appropriate password, Etcher proceeds to flash the contents of the image file onto the microSD card. When it's done, it verifies that the contents of the card match the contents of the file. And once Etcher has done its thing, it ejects the SD card. Which is unfortunate because there's a file that we need to edit to tell it how to connect to the Wi-Fi network, so I'll remove the card and reinsert it into the reader. And now it's mounted, so now I can edit that file. On macOS, many people use its built-in text editor called TextEdit. But this is specifically not recommended for editing configuration files because it can be more than just a plain text editor. It can support multiple fonts and text styles, which, while nice to look at, can completely ruin a configuration file. I'll use it in a pinch, but my preferred plain text editor is bbedit. For basic editing, it's free, and I'll be using it in this video. In the same way, Windows has WordPad, which also supports fonts and text styles and can kill a configuration file. So, in Windows, you can use the built-in Notepad app to edit the configuration file, or consider something like Notepad++. Okay, so let's open up the card, and then we can edit the Octopi WPA Supplicant text file. And here it is in bbedit. The section we need to edit is the WPA slash WPA2 secured section. The first thing I'm going to do is remove the pound signs from the beginning of these four lines. That uncomments them and makes them active in the configuration. Then on the SSID line, inside the quotes, that's where your Wi-Fi network name goes. And on the PSK line, inside the quotes, that's where your Wi-Fi password goes. I'm not using my real password here. Obviously, I'll change that when you're not looking. That's all the changes we needed to make. So now we can save this file, quit bbedit or whichever text editor you're using, and eject the card. So now let's get the Raspberry Pi ready to go. First, I'll mount it in the case that I printed, and it just snaps into place. Then I'll insert the microSD card into the Raspberry Pi, and it goes in with the contacts facing the board. Then I'll give the Pi some power and wait a minute for it to boot. Okay, now that it's booted, we can connect to it with an SSH client and go through the security setup on the Pi's operating system. 
After that, we'll be able to connect to Octoprint with a web browser and go through its initial configuration. So in macOS, you'll use the terminal utility for this, and in Windows 10, you'll use the command prompt. Both macOS and Windows 10 understand Bonjour networking, so we can connect to the address octopi.local. And on both terminal in macOS and the command prompt in Windows 10, we are literally using the exact same command, and that's this, ssh space pi at octopi.local. That starts a secure connection to the Raspberry Pi, and the very first time you connect to it this way, you may see a security prompt and you can answer in the affirmative that you want this connection to proceed. The pi at part of the command lets the Raspberry Pi know that we want to log in as the user named pi. And that user's password is raspberry, so type that in when prompted and press return. Okay, now we're connected and we can start the initial configuration. And to configure the Raspberry Pi, we're going to use a utility called Raspi Config. We need to do it as the super user though, so we'll use sudo, that's super user do, like so. sudo space raspi dash config, and then we'll press return. We'll need to provide the Pi user's password again. First things first, let's go change the password of the Pi user. That's in system options and then password. Now pick something that you'll remember. And then we can change the time zone, and that's in localization, and then time zone. I'll scroll through and find Chicago because I'm in central time in the United States. And let's change the host name too. This setting is in system options, and then host name. Right now it's Octopi, but I like to set the name to match the printer that it's going to be associated with. But it can only be letters, digits, and hyphens, as long as the hyphens aren't the first or the last character. So I'll set this to Ender 3. Now once we save all this and reboot the Pi, it'll no longer exist at octopi.local and will instead exist at Ender3.local. To save, use the Tab key to get down to the buttons at the bottom of the utility, arrow over to Finish, and then press Return, and then confirm that you want to reboot. And it'll take a minute or so to reboot. Okay, now that it's rebooted, we can connect to it with a web browser and go through Octoprint's initial configuration. So, since I changed the host name of the Raspberry Pi to Ender3.local, that's where I need to connect. So, I'll go to http colon slash slash Ender3.local. And now we're in the setup wizard. On this first screen, I'll click Next. Octoprint wants to know if I want to restore from a backup. Now, I don't have a backup of an Octoprint instance that I want to restore, so I'll just click Next to go past this screen. As for access control, this is important. Now, this step used to be optional, but now it's required. You have to set up a username and a password to log into your Octoprint instance. I'll set mine up now by filling in the username and the password that I want to use, and then I'll click Create Account. Now, I can click Next to continue. I'm perfectly happy to allow anonymous usage tracking of my Octoprint instance, so I'll enable it. If you don't want to do this, click Disable and then click Next. Now I always leave the connectivity check settings at their standard values, so I'll scroll down to the bottom, click Enable Connectivity Check, and then click Next to proceed. I also always enable plug-in blacklist processing, so I'll click Enable and then click Next. Now it's time to set up the printer profile. There are four tabs, General, Print Bed and Build Volume, Axes, and Hot End and Extruder. And we'll go through each one. As you may have guessed, I'll be using this Octoprint instance with an Ender 3, so that's what I'm going to name the profile. Then I'll click the Print Bed tab. Here, the default settings for the form factor, origin, and heated bed are correct, so I'll scroll down to set the build volume. For an Ender 3, this is 220 by 220 by 250 millimeters. With those set, I'll scroll back up and click the Axes tab. I never change these, and they've always worked correctly for me, no matter what printer I've used, so I'm going to keep these at the standard values. Now I'll click the Hot End and Extruder tab. In here, I'm going to keep this at 0.4 millimeters for the nozzle diameter and 1 for the number of extruders. And then I can click Next to proceed. 
There's some useful information here, basically telling you to never leave a printer unattended and never make your Octoprint instance publicly available on the internet. And of course, a request to support the project if you find it useful. I personally do find it useful, so I support the project on Patreon. Now I'll click finish to, well, to finish. Octoprint will then set itself up based on the choices that I made, and then we're ready to connect it to a printer. We're almost done. The only thing left to do is connect a USB cable between the Pi and the printer, tell the Pi to connect to the printer, and send a file to print. Okay, I've got the Raspberry Pi in its case mounted above the power supply, and the Pi and the printer are both powered up. So I'll plug in a USB cable into an available port on the Pi, and then plug the other end into the printer's USB port. With both devices connected, we can tell Octoprint to connect to the printer. Now, since I want Octoprint to connect to the printer, or attempt to, every time it starts up, I'm going to check the Auto Connect box first, and then I'm going to click Connect. And just like that, the two things are talking to each other. In this section here, there are tabs for Temperature, Control, G-Code Viewer, Terminal, and Time Lapse. Temperature shows you a nice graph of your printer's temperatures and also allows you to adjust them even during a print. You can set the temperature for both the hot end and the bed here. Control is where, if you had a webcam attached to the Pi, you could see what it was looking at. But you also have the ability to move the X, Y, and Z axes around or extrude some filament or turn the parts cooling fan on or off. G-Code Viewer shows you the progress of the layer that's currently being printed. Terminal shows you the status information that's being emitted by the firmware. Now this is where information for the temperature graph comes from, for example. You can stop showing certain things in the terminal with these checkboxes down here. And you can type G-code commands directly to the printer and see the responses. This is handy for things like tuning e-steps or PID tuning or any other situation where you'd want to send commands and get status responses. And finally, the Time Lapse tab has controls for taking time lapse videos. This is the built in time lapse software, and it's pretty basic, but it does record time lapse videos of your print. There's a much nicer time lapse plugin called Octolapse, which has a ton of controls, and you can set it to take one frame per layer instead of one frame every few seconds, like this one does. Okay, down here on the lower left, there's a file list. Now, right now, it's showing me files on the printer's micro SD card. I usually set it to show me only the files that I've uploaded to Octoprint, and I do that with the little wrench icon here. I set it to only show files stored locally. I guess at this point, all that's left to do is upload a G code file and start it printing. I happen to have a G code file right here. It's just an XYZ cube, but it'll do. The process of printing a G code file is literally just drag drop, and print. Once I click print, Octoprint takes over and starts printing the file. And that's all there is to it. Now you can see the target temperatures being set on the graph, and you can see the actual temperatures on their way to meet them. Once the printer is up to temperature, the file starts printing. And then after about a half an hour, the print is done. Now you can see interesting stats about the print, such as when you uploaded it to Octoprint, how much filament it used, how long it took to print, and the size of the file. So that's how to set up Octoprint on a Raspberry Pi using the OctoPi SD card image. It's as close to plug and play as you can get without having someone set it up for you. The only things you have to tell it are your Wi-Fi network name and its password. And once you can connect to your new Octoprint instance, you take care of the necessary security settings and then answer a few questions to get Octoprint set up for your printer. Octoprint also has a big plugin repository, which makes it easy to extend the functionality. And of course, Octoprint is free. A Raspberry Pi isn't, but Octoprint is. I mean, if you didn't want to use a Raspberry Pi, but you had an old computer sitting around, there are instructions on the site for installing and configuring Octoprint on Mac OS, Windows, and Linux. It's just a lot more involved. If time is money, the OctoPi plus Raspberry Pi route is, in my opinion, the most cost effective. Now, if you do end up installing and using OctoPrint, consider supporting the project. There's a link in the description to all the various ways that you can help support OctoPrint. Well, 3D printing friends, that's about all the time we have for this episode. And now that we're at the end, let's go OctoPrint something cool. 
Hey, real quick before you go, I wanted to say thanks for being one of the super awesome people who sticks around all the way to the end. And thanks for all the likes, comments, and shares, and an especially big thanks to those who directly support what I do. You're all wonderful for doing that, and I really appreciate it. If you liked this episode, a thumbs up would be great, and if you'd like to help support the channel, check the description for ways you can do exactly that. Please check out some of my other videos, and hey, if you haven't already subscribed, please do. It's absolutely free, and it's an excellent way to help keep me making these videos for you. Well, that's it for this one. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time here on the BV3D channel.